over the last year, everyone's been experimenting. There's been a lot of POCs and pilots done with AI. But cut to today, what are they buying? At least when I tried using some of the AI image generators, I would log into Discord each time to go and use Mid Journey. Even though like Fireflies is probably a one-click UX. It was so much easier, but I put myself through that trouble just because I like Mid Journey's output. Product innovation is done. The only way to win with mature products is to actually create distribution innovation. Probably doesn't apply. This traditional pricing model, the flat, fee pricing model doesn't apply to AI. Do I need to give a serious answer to that? I don't know. Hey everybody, we're the Z47 SaaS team. This is Pranay and I'm Ashwin and we're going to talk to you about building enduring SaaS AI companies. Today, I'm going to be picking Pranay's brain about three broad areas. So one, what are CIOs buying today? What are elements that help you create real repeatable revenue? And how should you pick a lucrative market to play in? So with that, let's get started. So uh, Pranay, let's kick this off. And if we had to take a customer backward view, over the last year, everyone's been experimenting. There's been a lot of POCs and pilots done with AI, but cut to today. What are they buying and what are customers looking for? All right. Good question and glad to be here, Ashwin. So I'll start with the role of a CIO, right? Now, the role of a CIO in an enterprise was always to bring in technology to enable the business. I think today the big switch is that CIOs, instead of enabling the business, are trying to protect the business, right? Because I think there's so much AI coming in. We don't know the implications in terms of, you know, like guardrails around our data and security and all of that. And we need to make sure that we use it, but do a good job of it, right? So I spoke to a CIO who said, I am buying one of two things. Either I'm buying AI for security or I am buying security for AI, right? But people are very worried about security and compliance and the current modus operandi is protect the business, right? And I think two, three examples of this, right? Defense mechanism number one, we heard from a portfolio company that our customer is not able to use the product because the CIO blocked all .ai domains in their office internet, right? So uh, if you are an AI founder, buy a .com domain, not a .ai domain. Uh, number two, buy something horizontal to enable the enterprise, but get away from evaluating and approving 100 different vendors, right? Because I think right now CIOs will have 10 functional teams coming saying we want five different AI tools, please evaluate and approve and you don't have the bandwidth. So you can invest in chat GPT for enterprise and tell every team as a pushback that hey, we have chat GPT for enterprise. If you can use this for like 50, 60, 70% of your use case, go ahead and utilize this, right? It's not invest in one more solution. Uh, so if CIOs are kind of becoming on this defense mode, hmm. then is the answer kind of, hey, let me build a product that appeals to all CIOs, or is there also like a workaround around it? So I don't know if everyone's familiar with this term, but when like cloud happened, there was this term of called shadow IT, hmm. right? Which was the rise of, you know, there are subscription products on cloud. Without telling my CIO, I can go sign up for a vendor, start using their product. You can imagine how many people in your company might be using Notion or Airtable, copying and pasting company data over there, but the CIO will not know about it, right? So I think just like shadow IT, there is a shadow AI movement where people are either using free AI tools or they are buying them with like their personal credit card and personal subscriptions and expensing it later, but they are using it whether you like it or not, right? So one path, especially when you your product has like a unit of value where you know one individual can utilize the product and find value is to just open it up with like very low entry cost, very fast time to value. If uh, your product sort of subscribes to all of that, you can go that route and just get a lot of spread, right? And in the last decade, that's what powered the PLG wave, right? Like whether it's Figma or Slack or whatever, companies start using, then CIOs buy top-down licenses for compliance and enterprise -y controls, right? So that works. The second is you can sell to a functional leader, but if you have a very strong business case, right? Now I was speaking to someone who builds like a horizontal collaboration app and is a CX over there. They said they have free AI features, which they wanted to enable at a, a Fortune 500 company. 
they had 19 calls with legal and compliance and they didn't get the green light to enable a free feature. Now, the same company was selling a product to the contact center organization. They said two calls they were able to sell AI contact center solutions because there was very clear business value. It is driven by the board and it is driven by the CEO to change cost structures by deploying AI. Contact center is obviously the first place you can see that. And it took two calls, right? So uh, that's the difference, right? So if you're able to show business value for a functional leader, which matches kind of board and CEO priorities, you can bulldoze and get through. So. Yeah, and I think over maybe the last couple of years, we've built a portfolio of now probably 10 enterprise AI companies. And uh, through this, looking at some of these winning patterns, companies that have managed to deliver or create value, what are they getting right? No, interesting question. I think first is, if you're thinking about, again, B2B and yeah. enterprise use cases, what are people buying you for? Yeah. Right. The first evaluation criteria is still quality of output. Right. So mm -hmm. if I take Merv for example, right, it is AI voiceovers. I have a video, I want to add a voiceover. So first I'm looking for two or three voices which match this particular video use case. So uh, that range and selection of voices is important. Second is, do I like the quality? Right. So the primary decision is still made on quality of output. Right. And then when you think about getting embedded into use cases, it is the depth of the workflow, right? So I think, uh, and I know someone tweeted, come for the model, stay yeah. for the workflow. I think that's what we are seeing. And at some point it will switch, but today it is still quality of output, right? And we are early in the S-curve where it is early adopters. They are looking at this novelty and X factor of the use case. Hmm. Uh, and they are taking on friction to actually use the product. And we will talk about friction and UX later. Uh, but I think in the longer term, workflows will become important when people move from step one to step two, don't know yet. And UX is actually an interesting point here, which we can talk about, is what are some of those like points or examples of great quality where people are saying, okay, I will put myself through trouble just because the output here is so good. Where have you kind of seen some of that work? No, so I think people do it with chat GPT, right? If I want to draft a social post or draft an article, I don't think anyone has still gotten the UX right, right? Like, because I put a prompt, it writes something. I cannot select and edit part of the answer. I can give it feedback and it will rewrite the entire content. After that, I copy it. I paste it into a Google Doc or any other place. I make my own edits then I probably check it with Grammarly and then I publish, right? So it is still multi-step, but it's novel enough that you use it despite the friction, right? And I think that's a feature that says it's okay, it's really valuable. But otherwise, like has someone created a good UX where you're using an AI writer in your regular workflow? At least I've not experienced it, right? And maybe the Figma slides, like the two by two matrix where you can drag a, the dot from no, a spectrum of casual to professional and it rewrites short form copy is interesting, but uh, I think there's still some way to go in terms of building good friction free UX. Yeah, no, and I agree because I remember at least when I tried using some of the AI image generators, I would log into Discord each time to go and use Mid Journey, even though like Fireflies is probably a one click uh, sort of. UX. It was so much easier, but I would put myself through that trouble just because I like Midjourney's output. But the minute Dali got easier and came on to GPT-4, I just stopped using Midjourney. Now I just have chat GPT-4 and I use everything. So, Which is true as long as the quality is good enough. Yeah. Right? So Yeah. And when we also talk about these, like traditional SaaS was always that build and it's how you would put it, India loves the Thali system, build everything <laughs> versus like that point solution yeah. sort of approach. What is that the same here or how do you think about building thick stack versus thin? It actually applies to food. We have our meals family style, right? We want variety. When you go abroad, you order one dish and you eat the one dish, right? So I think, uh, see the power has always been, I think uh, Parker Conrad coined the term compound startup mm. for rippling where you're combining HR, IT and payroll. Uh, I think Indian companies like Zoha and Freshworks have always done that, right? And the difference was that I think at least cost of recruiting engineers in India was 
lower so you could build larger engineering teams early on and these companies would then go multi product earlier in their life cycle hmm. right so i think it's been part of the dna uh when i think about changes in terms of construct i think this all in one solutions and more consolidation amongst vendors is here to stay because all these workflows and agentic experiences will also be powered by data right now if i have 30 different tools in my sales tech stack and each one is asking for access full access to all customer data including support tickets and crm and all of that i am not going to enable that right but so just unifying the data and knowledge graph and context so that you can power workflows on top or build better ai experiences i think will drive a lot more consolidation right and you know i was always not a believer in glean because i yeah. felt like it's you know it's sold to a cio it's a horizontal use case business productivity but no clear roi and kudos to the team to figure out how they did it uh, but once they have access to all internal systems that entire knowledge graph i think they are actually best position to create applications and agentic experiences on top which can power workflows right because they already have access to the data so i think the future is more consolidated more all in one versus these point solution solves that we've seen over the last decade and if we just look at the time it takes to build this out if you're building out a lot of features it's definitely going to take a while so what do you tell founders like hey ship fast or build patiently and build full stack so interesting and uh, this is one more place i'm going to talk about all the mistakes that we made uh, but uh, like i said like glean didn't like the thesis was always a disbeliever but now i see reasons to believe obviously proved wrong uh, i think this is something similar right and maybe over the last decade when i thought about software companies my answer was always move slow and build right like do a lot of customer discovery understand problems build your figma mocks take it to customers but basically sign on five design partners take a long build process and then build for those people right today my answer is a little bit different for one or two reasons right one is it's like the ipad moment right if you go and ask customers what they want they can't articulate it to you but once you are given an ipad you have a lot of interesting ways you'll utilize it right so there are these latent requirements so spend time with customers to do research on uh, kind of what is their existing workflow jobs to be done and all the detailing uh, the solutioning will be more creative intuition customers will not be able to articulate what they want right so you'll have to figure out what that looks like and i think again when we hear from the portfolio the hardest part about ux is customers don't know what they expect right and it's like even if you take a crm you have all these structured fields right it looks like a, it's basically html forms on top of a database right that's a crm today now if you have all this unstructured data you want a creative way to present what's happening in a particular account who are the people involved what is the strength of relationship what is their nps what are the recent events there's probably a different way to visualize that particular account page in a crm right so now will a customer articulate that to you probably not right so one problem is that when you think about this product feedback loop with customers it has to be very iterative where you put something in front of them get reactions look at how they are using it so i think you need to ship fast number one number two earlier it the solutioning used to be figma mocks the tech at the back end was pretty steady and fixed and we didn't care too much about it now you have models and you also need the models to get to output quality now the only way to do that is by testing in the real world we have companies who have made like gold golden test like and yeah. data sets and all of that till you give that model to a customer you don't know how they are going to break it and what crazy left field questions they are going to ask and what output your model is going to put out so the other reason to ship fast is so that you have the data flywheel and the feedback loop going with customers on model and model quality so that you can continue to iterate on that front and get to excellent quality yeah. metrics right so answer today ship fast because you have to iterate on the ux i believe at least with customers in public and keep putting things in front of them and to get your sort of model output quality in the right place you need to again ship to customers early are there situations where you would probably say ship patiently or build patiently because 
I'm assuming customers are also bombarded with tools today. They're just trying multiple tools and if something doesn't work, they let it go. So, I don't know. Is there a way to think about, hey, okay, ship fast for certain products, maybe build patiently if you're another type of product. So, I think the answer might be like, are you in an existing market versus a new market? Hmm. Right? If it's an existing market or like where you are reinventing things, Again, customers will have a lot of expectations and a lot of opinions on what are the right ways to do things, right? So, and to replace that incumbent, you also might have a long build time, yeah. right? So, even if you take something like sales or customer service, you have to do, you know, like there is routing of tickets to, you can have customer service automation, but there will be a live agent view, there will be routing mechanisms of can I find the right agent to solve a particular problem, there are things like role-based access control. I'm a public company. I don't want sales reps to see like CRM revenue fields. Otherwise, they can tell where the company is headed yeah. in terms of <laughs> revenue, right? All of these problems don't go away. So if it's existing categories, you might have a long build time because there's so many things you need to build to get to parity. And then there is the differentiation part where the ship fast might still apply, right? So... Uh, so it makes sense. And I mean, switching gears a bit to some of these business models in GTM that we see today, and I'll tie it back to the first question we spoke about, like what do CIOs care about? So today, if there's someone thinking about building an AI product, I think two years ago, everyone said, hey, there was this whole wave of PLG and self-serve, let's pick up those models and try selling through them. Does the same apply when it comes to enterprise AI products, or has that changed between a more top-down approach versus something bottom-up? So. Again, just tracing through history, right? Mm. Like when I think of the cloud movement which happened like mid 2000s, I think every time you have new technology, it distorts markets or creates new markets, right? So I think the first half of that, like the new, like any new market creation opportunity, there is scope for product innovation, right? And that's where you differentiate. So if I think, and see, like what happened with cloud was, it opened up a new market, which was really the SMB and mid-market because software was always domain of the enterprise. Uh, it's on-premise, so you need servers and the entire stack. It's an expensive one-time license, so it was all CapEx. Now, when you convert it to OpEx with a low cost of entry because there are shared resources in the background, you had companies spin up like Zendesk and HubSpot and Freshworks, which were you know, building for the masses, right? The Fortune 5 million, not the Fortune 5,000. So there was a new market. And there could be a lot of product innovation that won the early wave, right? Now, later on in that cycle, when product innovation is done, the only way to win with mature products is to actually create distribution innovation, right? So I think the last decade, most companies which have been successful have been playing on distribution innovation. And it used to be the model was take a traditional top-down enterprise selling market, convert it to bottom-up selling right? And maybe the figmas of the world. I'm not saying they don't have product innovation. They do. The canvas of the world. But they, a lot of the business model relied on distribution innovation. Next five years, I think we are slipping back, right? So product innovation, very important. Uh, that said, I think there's too much innovation compressed in too little time, yeah. right? Because just like buyers are learning how to buy, users don't know what to expect and how to use these products. Same way, technologists are figuring out what to make of this technology and product people are thinking about what is new UX, new workflow, right? So I think creative product thinkers will actually come up with product innovation and can win and win big in the next five years because a lot of new markets are getting created right now. So when we talk about some of these things around too many tools, users being confused what to buy, doesn't that create like this white space for professional services? And what's your take? Is that then a moat? So I think professional services is definitely a moat and it is for everyone. Uh, also, maybe more so it plays in the favor of India because, you know, again, we can recruit, it is lower cost, although, you know, other people it's can like also It's like our DNA as well with all the tech service guys. Yeah. So I think, and my answer for that is, many fold. I think uh, one is obviously like we spoke about how people don't know what to expect. And if there's, you know, process interventions and all of that, you need a consultative sales process. Second, 
when you have to deploy these tools, right, you have to, you know, there is this data wrangling exercise of configuring product or creating more data to get models to perform to a particular quality metric to deploy within an enterprise. A lot of that work, again, companies may not have the capability or the know-how or the bandwidth. It is good to take that on just to make sure that they are successful, right? And maybe example of this was that uh, even at Freshworks, we had acquired a couple of AI companies. When we went to sell it, we were selling it to a large mobile app in the UK, I remember. And we basically offered to them that we will automate your customer service to a certain percentage. And for the first quarter of the journey, you will have a deflection team, a ticket deflection team, as we like put it in the proposal. But it was basically a four-member team who would look at all their support queries, would look at their knowledge article, would figure out where are the gaps, what new knowledge article should we create, how do we train the bot so that we are actually able to hit that threshold. right? And it was part of the reason we won the deal. right? So I think founders should build a very strong services org, not give it away for free, actually charge, and I'm saying charge a premium for it so that you also know it's world-class and people, deserve, like people are paying for it because it's world-class. Viva did that, right? So their services was a 25% margin uh, business, but it also helps customers become more successful. It helps with renewals, right? Uh, so that's one part of services. I think the other part is just like this data generation, data labeling, data curation. I think India has a big role to play and I think there's so many uh, I think a lot of model training is restricted by data availability and quality and we have a lot of talent. So I think there is a company that can be built over there. Why did you say charge a premium? Because intuitively when I think about it, I'm like, okay, I can do professional services cheap. I'll give it for free. It'll help me win everything, right? Charge a premium because it, it sets the bar for the team internally. Right? Got it. When you think I'm giving it away for free, you're like, okay, I can make do, and then it can lead to things like, oh, I've not staffed enough, there is a backlog. Or sometimes from a customer side, there is this scope creep, right? So mm -hmm. even defining exact scope, pricing, overages also forces the customer to prioritize. So it is also skin in the game from a customer side. It is communicating the seriousness of your offering for the team internally. So I think it works well in both sides. That makes sense. Otherwise, they would think if he's throwing it in for free, it's probably worth nothing. There's a third one. Yeah. So when we put this, like I remember one international court when we had huh. shipped it out with like free implementation. When we said free implementation, the customer inferred no implementation that <laughs> I'll have to do myself, right? So even on the court, when we put implementation fee $50,000 for you special one-time discount to zero and you send like a statement of work or SOW document, people feel like you are running a more mature, more serious org and you will come through with it, right? And, uh, you know, that lends its way into pricing. And a lot of people talk about how traditional SaaS pricing probably doesn't apply. This traditional pricing model, the flat fee pricing model doesn't apply to AI. So do you agree with that or what are your thoughts on that? No, I think uh, there will be some evolution. Hmm. I know there's a horrible term coming, which I don't enjoy, <laughs> which is outcome-based pricing. Uh, so my take is, obviously, pricing model has to in some way relate to value you are creating, right? Uh, which is fair, right? The reason, and maybe there was seed-based pricing in traditional SaaS applications, which continues to work. There is usage-based pricing, which was mostly the domain of infrastructure companies, right? Because it links very strongly to their cost structure. It links very closely to what developers are using. The more messages you send on Twilio, the more you get charged and it aligns to the value you are delivering in some way. Uh, but it is still in your control, right? I don't like the term outcome-based pricing because, uh, you know, if behind the scenes, what you are doing, how you are doing it, it's not in control of that person, right? Now, let's say I use Intercom. Uh, Intercom, I guess, is $1 per resolution. Yeah. I don't remember the latest figure. Now, if on the weekend, there's a bug on my website, there's suddenly a surge of customer queries. Will my bill go up 10x this month? Enterprises like predictability, this is not predictable, right? So if it is in my control, I'm okay with it. If it's in the hands of the customer and they they can, you know, like 
intercom can again worst case scenario thinking set up a ring of bots which will attack my website and keep creating queries right i don't know right so i think it's highly unpredictable that's number 1 which enterprise buyers do not like right number 2 on the same thing right if intercom is saying price per resolution right how do i know if something has been resolved or not because you came to the chat you asked a question i gave you an answer now i will ask was this the right answer 95% of people will close the window or close the tab on their browser and move on right do i charge for those do i not charge for those right and the right behavior like if i think from a customer behavior perspective i came to the chatbot i asked a question it gave an answer i didn't like the answer what do i do next i go call a support line or i complain yeah. on social is someone tying this back right so the outcome metric itself is not measurable in this case according to me right so is it a measurable outcome are the inputs in terms of the usage within the control of the company or not right i think those two things matter a lot right and if those line up then maybe it makes sense but i'll say a lot of value will align with usage but you have to think about how do i solve for predictability for the enterprise right and i think marketing automation companies had a good answer for this which was i won't charge you per user in your database but i will charge you based on threshold so can be like okay if you have 50k to 100k monthly active users mm-hmm. pay me this much if you have 100k to 500k pay me this much so it's a fixed price if i am a public market cfo and i need to plan my expenses and forecast for the next quarter and the next year i can put a fixed number and i know that's the invoice i'm getting but it is loosely linked to the scale of my usage or the amount of value that i'm receiving right so yeah. i think it's a I think even the itself. box one yeah. was interesting, which we spoke about, right? Like box, their AI features was each cre- each user gets probably some twenty credits or something of that sort for AI features, but then they had this horizontal set of enterprise credits. So any time a power user would expend his own credits, you start tapping into the horizontal enterprise credits. That way, you keep promoting users to become power users, and those that exceeded just use existing credits, and you're not kind of giving a CFO that. heart attack of unpredictable billing so i mean some form of pricing innovation i think is needed and if we switch gears to talk about now a founder who's been building for a year or two years and wants to look back and measure his business and it also probably looks the same for vcs so how do you measure a good ai business today and what should you look at so i think and there are phases to this right mm. so i think the first one is actually usage right so you will ideally build a top funnel bring people in and get them to use the product right and the real meat in that is are they actually using the product or not right so i would look at usage right the next thing you'll see is you'll see a power cohort where you are seeing repeat usage right and repeat might be different for different use cases like customer service is a daily use case we creating a voice over might be a weekly or a monthly use case so repeat usage might have a different definition but there like there will be a small cohort of people if they like the product they will keep coming back right and then the third is i think of it as spread right so either it is you know people inviting other collaborators into the workflow or they are sharing files or you get word of mouth virality but are they telling other people about it right yeah. and then there is revenue right so i think that's the spectrum and if i think of parallels it's actually similar to how you would measure a consumer business right if you were running facebook in the early days you would first think about how many people are signing up for facebook then you would think about how many people are visiting the app every day and then are people telling others or sharing it with others and pulling other people into the fold so i think a lot of parallels with consumer businesses actually exist and when you say focus on the power users so as a founder now we keep looking at churn and logo churn nrr and all of that does that still stay the same do you still continue to look at that the way you do for saas or do you just focus on this power user group so there is a nuance here of are you mm. referring to a like a top down company because over there i'm going to have x number of customers yeah. right and then at a per customer account level i can look at what is real usage and product usage metrics 
and yeah. that tells me is this person going to renew or not 12 months down the line right and then there is a customer success job of managing the relationship with like the champion or the buyer persona within that organization if it's more like product led and self serve then you will have a lot of usage right and that like consumerish usage will be a lot of again novelty factor you know yeah. ashwin and pranay signed up and tried something out never came back and we saw that spike i think like just yeah. the we saw ad- the spike we saw it drop yeah. now steadily it's sort of going up again yeah. right uh, but now over there i think there's two right you have to continue building see we are in this behavior defining phase right mm. so a lot of people are in this dating phase with ai tools they'll come and try everything and it's okay right you have to play that game because some subset of them will convert to power users right and power users are the ones who will sort of are the real early adopters who are consistently using your product and then that will build over the longer term right so they can dictate what to build for retention and maybe the kind of novelty factor and all you still need to play that game while we're talking about companies that create enduring value i think a topic we've not yet touched upon is this data and the data advantage everyone said last year build a data moat build a data advantage but i want to know if that's even possible a lot of companies are skeptical about letting their data go out to these models so what's your take on it no so i think again interesting question and maybe consumer and enterprise mm. is very different right some places uh, there might be data that as an enterprise you don't care about as much right like if i'm creating like in the example of say murf right i am creating a voice over do i care about whether it goes back into some sort of training model or not not really do i want them to replicate my voice no but can it be used as like for training or for feedback or something like that Re- like i wouldn't think about it too hard right so in that case maybe there are some parts of the business or some use cases where that data flywheel does work right the other place where it's important is this feedback cycle right so in the case of merge like every time someone edits a pronunciation of a word it is a feedback loop right or you know someone said like numbers are not numbers it depends on the context so you if it's currency you speak in thousands and millions and billions if it's a phone number you recite it out right digit by digit so that type of feedback helps you get the model better in the next iteration or it helps you fine tune for this particular use case right so when i think about data flywheel there's kind of gathering data to train models and broadly it's right that in enterprise use cases you will not get that opportunity right then there is this thing of the feedback loop right another company we've backed is atomic work right which automates it and like internal service management workflows now over there the great thing about it is the vocabulary is same across every company right you have the same macbooks and you know ibm laptops and cisco networking equipment and password reset queries and software install queries so the language is very similar if someone is asking for a password reset in a device does an enterprise care about that data not really would they still give you access to train on that data maybe maybe not if you are accessing hr data and the employee directory they will not give it to you right now when there's so many different workflows if you are using it in customer accounts and you have usage going you can tell that hey maybe my model or constellation of models i'm using to answer queries is working well for it requests but not as well for hr requests or you know if someone's asking for like what is how many leaves do i have left is a different type of query but that feedback loop actually helps you uh, iterate towards better and better outcomes for the customer right so i think there is one part is collecting data one part might be labeling data labeling data also has advantages because if you are asking people for softer signals of is this good enough for this or does this match this like it can work over there and then there is this you know like the human feedback on output of models so different ways to think about it but it should like that data flywheel should figure in your strategy the first two parts of that flywheel which is you sort of said 
getting access to prop data and then also finding some way to label it. A lot of that ties to companies that are actually training, building their own models. And Murph has done a great job. But should other companies be building models or how should they think of that? So interesting question. And uh, I think, see, if you are in any new market, the first phase of companies will be vertically integrated, right? And maybe in semiconductors, Intel was a great example of this, right? And then that strength does become your weakness because there's so much competition and the competition will lead to competition at every layer of the stack. And then there is this unbundling, right? And where Intel had this lead and they had this tick and talk strategy, TSMC came up with a better fab, right? Uh, then there's so many different design houses who would just be very good at chip design, TSMC would manufacture, and then Intel became the laggard, right? So Even the PCs. Yeah. PCs, same thing happened, right? So I think when you take super large markets, right? And LLMs, especially like language and text is one such example. Maybe video, and I consider images as a subset because it's one frame within a video, but is another super large market where you will see unbundling, right? And there are infra companies who can host infra. There are model companies, closed source, open AI, Anthropic, Cohere. But there's also so many open source options in Mistral and Llama and all. The right answer is you will end up using a combination of these. If you look at, again, like for knowledge, you have vector databases, there's five vendors over there, and then applications separate. Now, as an application company, should you be building your own database and your own model? Very hard to justify, right? So I think just taking best of breed from everything under the in the lower layers and putting it together into kind of assembling Lego blocks to your own unique skyscraper is the right answer according to me. So in most cases, especially these super large markets, you should not be building your own models. If you are in a smaller market where this competitive intensity is not going to be there, then you should probably build your own models, right? And maybe if I look at old world speech to text, so there were companies like Gong who were doing conversational intelligence. They started in 2015. At the same time, you had companies like DeepGram and Assembly AI launch. And then today there's OpenAI Whisper. So there's probably three people who give you a speech to text API of reasonable quality. And there is a full stack company like Gong, right? Now, if Gong has to say, I'll use best of breed, the answer won't work because these companies are seeking a 50% or a 70% margin, which will not work in terms of economics, right? So I think in most Large markets, don't build models. If you're building application companies, just use what's out there and maybe fine tune and like train to your own use case. Uh, if you are in a smaller market, you have to be more vertically integrated, right? So over there, your models, your data stack, your application. How should founders pick markets? Because I'm guessing if you're starting a company today, you want to stack as many odds in your favor as possible. So how should they choose a market? Good question and uh, I think more nuanced answer. So the first is I'll talk about net new opportunity. And when I say net new opportunity, there's two ways to think about it. One is that, you know, like software spending is 10% of a company's expense list. If we spend 300 billion on or 400 billion on software, we actually spend 4 trillion on people. So if we are saying more work gets automated, there is this big rebalancing where pe companies will spend more on software, less on people. So let's look at what are people doing and can we productize that work, right? So it will apply to a lot of things like contact center is the first place where people are trying to automate and reduce the customer service staffing and number of people. A lot of back office work like, you know, closing your books, reconciling, accounts payable, workflows, things like that. So a lot of spend moving from people and headcount to domain of software, right? So those net new opportunities are absolutely good places to build, but they will be extremely competitive, right? And that is a given, right? The second way to think about it is what are net new capabilities that you'll build, right? So it's like, and that's where like this term of, you know, agents and mm, AI first mm. and everything we speak about is, uh, is there a new capability which is now possible, which wasn't possible in the past, right? Or will things move? Like if you think about UiPath, they started the name 
answers yeah. what they do, right? So it was UI, like old world applications. They had built screen readers to actually do steps and automate. Now, if you think of RPA and you say, I can have RPA for every company, every individual, every knowledge worker, it can be very powerful, right? So I think a lot of new use cases, new market opportunities move from headcount spend to product spend. Absolutely play those, right? If you go into existing categories, existing markets, existing budgets, a little more skeptical over there, but there is a path, right? One is, again, classic answer, but look for fat and lazy old world incumbents, which were born in the pre-cloud era, right? Yeah. And it applied for traditional SaaS also, but I think uh, Rocket Lane, one of our portfolio companies, they compete with a company called OnPlan, which was born in the 1980s, right? So can you build more modern solutions and better answers there? Uh, yes, right? If a company is born in the cloud era, right? Or if they are very fast executors and I'm thinking of companies like HubSpot and Datadog, I would be afraid to compete with them, right? Now, over there, what you need to think about is how am I disrupting the product as well as the business model, right? And there is, for me, wholesale product innovation. There is this pricing and business model innovation right? And there is like UX and workflow innovation, right? Which is part of the product. And there can be distribution innovation, right? Now, old world example, and I'm still waiting for a lot of good new examples, but was a company like Canva, right? Adobe was selling software. Now, what did Canva do? They made everybody a good designer. Right? If I am a marketer, I don't need to go to my design team to create a social media creative, right? And Enterprise handovers are hard. Now, can everything move from the specialist role to like, will all of us be more generalist in the future? That you and I are now a 8 on 10 blogger and a 8 on 10 video creator and an 8 on 10 illustrator because we can use AI to create a lot of these things, right? So if you can shift job functions from one team to another, it is interesting kind of change in the architecture of an enterprise workflow and it can create wholesale product innovation, right? Uh, the second thing that they did was they changed the distribution. Adobe comes with a sales team. They sell a $250 a year license and which your design team buys. They reduce the pricing to like download a template for $1 and you can ship. So more aligned to your usage. They changed distribution where it was all templates and SEO. So if I search for a you know, like a social media creative for a venture firm, I will find a template on Canva, which I can edit and ship, right? So they changed distribution, they changed pricing, they changed product, but they also changed how companies work, right? And if someone's able to crack all of those, it becomes very hard for an incumbent to react to this, right? I would say, let's do a quick fire, but these are not really quick fire answer questions. Okay. But I'm gonna <laughs> throw it at you anyway. Um, what tech innovation are you most excited about that's yet to come? I think, uh, and again, in a lot of these companies, we've taken forward bets. Mm. So I think if like, it is these agentic experiences and uh, I think I'm very excited by the multimodal capabilities mm. because I think there's so much data which is not just in, so there is data in like unstructured written uh, language within a company, but there is, you know, speech and there is like video and there is images and there's just so much media content that you can consume uh, to then sort of consume structure index and then build kind of intelligent workflows on top. So I think I said RPA for everyone. Yeah. So that's interesting. I think uh, same way when I think about integrations, right? Like everyone like does these Zapier like workflows. Now integrations are limited by the API spec that a vendor puts out, right? So you are allowed to do these five things, you are rate limited, yeah. right? And you have to build integrations one after the other. What if I could log into through the front end? Because that's how software is designed because that's how people navigate software, right? So I could log into any application and I get complete access, right? Now, you have to solve for obviously latency because if you are going through the front end, it takes more time, so maybe real time jobs not as effective if you're doing sort of offline batch processing work, maybe it's more effective. Uh, second is you have to solve for reliability, right? So if you have agents which can do the work and you have these multimodal experiences, I think it just unlocks a lot of possibility. Right? I feel like the line between agentic and automation 
or RP is just very blurry. What does agentic mean to you? I think it is like rule based versus fuzzy logic, right? And I think step one, if you even follow again open AI research and recent media, they're saying step one is planning and reasoning. So it's like if I've told an agent that this is a task I want to complete, these are the tools you have, come up with a process, right? So it can write down, okay, these are the steps I will take to go from request to action to completion of a task. Step two is actually going and executing all of these things and then doing both of these things very reliably, right? Now, I think, are there some research breakthroughs required to get there? Yes, we are not there today. Devin and Cognition got a lot of interest online, but it works 13% of the time. But I think uh, when we speak to people smarter than us, if people believe it's possible, I think we are, I think about what can be the possible applications. Got it. And last question, what keeps you up at night? All the founders in the US who want to talk late night. So. <laughs> Cool. Do I need to give a serious answer to that? I don't know. If you're a founder building SaaS AI, or you just want to brainstorm, hit us up and we're happy to chat. The team at Z47 is super bullish about this domain and we're excited to see what India can do with it.